Emily's practice focuses on complex civil litigation, class action defense, products liability, and environmental torts in both the trial and appellate level. In 2008 and 2009, Washington Law and Politics magazine selected her as a rising star in Seattle's legal community. Here to discuss going the distance with class action jury trials, please welcome Emily Harris. We all deal with class actions every day in one way or another. Our clients might be getting sued. There's class actions in the news. We get a class action notice in the mail. Indeed, we're probably, every one of us in this room, members in class actions, in scores of class actions, and we don't even know it. The plaintiff's attorneys are getting more and more creative. Uh, you might get home from this weekend trip and open your mail and find this waiting for you. Yep, the class action of the month club. But there is some hope that the tide is turning. The Supreme Court in the last couple of years has issued a slew of opinions, uh, starting with the Concepcion case in 2011 regarding class action waivers. Uh, for arbitration, the seminal case of Walmart v. Dukes, which establishes a new bar for what, means, what it means to be common in a class action and what it means to conduct a rigorous analysis. And then in this year, I think probably one of the most notable cases is the Comcast case, where the court makes it clear that even if you have individual damages, unless the plaintiffs can come forward at the class certification stage with a common method, a viable common method to prove those damages at trial, they're not gonna get their class certified. So these cases provide us with a great deal of guidance. I uh, advise you if you're in this area to take a look at all of the case law. There's a lot of roadmaps for how to decertify a class, how to not get a class decertified in the first place, how to try a class action uh, and so those that would say, however, that this means that there's a demise in class actions, that they're going to go away, they probably underestimate the class action attorneys. I think class actions are here to stay. And while class action jury trials are rare, they are actually, I think, becoming more common than you might think. Uh, I was part of a trial team. I had the great fortune of litigating uh, a case for FedEx Ground. It was a four-week jury trial. Uh, for a class action on overtime wages, uh, and we were able to obtain a complete defense verdict for FedEx Ground on the issue of whether its owner-operators were improperly classified. As part of that process, we learned a lot of lessons about what it takes to try a class action, a certified class action, to a jury verdict in a lot of ways that might be different from the way that you might approach uh, a, non a standard non-class case for jury trial. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So the first thing, once you get a class certified, the first thing that you should always be thinking about and should be thinking about for the rest of the case is decertification. I don't have any fancy video clips in my presentation, but you might remember a movie called Glen Gary, Glen Ross. And in that film, Alec Baldwin's character has an iconic scene where he's giving a pep talk uh, to the sales managers. And the key point that he's making, and I can't use all the language that he was using, if many of you remember that scene, but his key point was always be closing. A, B, C. Always be closing. Well, when you're in the class action context, your mantra should be always be decertifying. So look for every opportunity you can from the moment of class certification through the end of the case to figure out a way to build your most effective record to decertify the case and to pick the most effective time to move for decertification. You can look at all of these different methods, many of which I'm going to talk about today. Discovery of class members can lead to variability in evidence. Motions directed at the named plaintiffs, such as an intervening bankruptcy where they may no longer be able to serve as a named plaintiff. Motions in limine with respect to common evidence. 
developing expert opinions that not only prove your merits case, but show that the plaintiff's evidence is different from class member to class member. The same thing with your trial evidence and your child witnesses. At every step, you should always be attempting to demonstrate that the class should no longer be certified. So this may seem like an obvious point, and certainly here in the network, uh, I would expect that everybody would be thinking about a jury demand. I was surprised in my own experiences to find out that plaintiffs in class actions are not always looking to go to a jury. Uh, and so if, you're, if your plaintiff is not demanding a jury, take the time to consider the pros and cons of taking your class certified class action to a jury. Certainly, the named plaintiff's class action uh, claims may not appeal to the jury pool in your jurisdiction. They may have credibility problems with their witnesses. If you've ever deposed a class action plaintiff, a named plaintiff, you may find that they don't always know a lot about what's going on, and uh, that may be a good target. And as always, I'm sure your client has a compelling story to tell. So there are lots of considerations to put into that pot, but the point here is simple. Don't ignore the fact that the plaintiff hasn't demanded a jury and think about whether that works for your client as well. The next thing I think that happens, or at least in our experience happens, is you should request or demand that the plaintiffs file a trial plan with the judge. Make them show you, if they haven't already done in certification, how they are going to come forward with common evidence at trial to prove the class claims. Um, this can be a very effective tool in setting up decertification. There is a great example of this in uh, this recent case from the Seventh Circuit. The, in, in, the, in the district court below, the court uh, certified subclasses because of the variability within the class. She said, come forward with a trial plan. The plaintiffs couldn't or wouldn't do it. Uh, and essentially said, we've got these 42 witnesses, they're quote representative. We've, you know, handpicked these witnesses, they're going to testify on every point. The judge said, you haven't shown that those witnesses can say anything common about anything in those classes and decertified the class. This opinion has great language in it. Uh, if you're going to push for a trial plan, it's a reasonable request given the difficulty of trying a class action. If class counsel is un incapable of proposing a plan, the, the judge's duty to maintain the class ends. So take advantage of seeking a, a trial plan. Also, class member discovery, while it's not often allowed, it is a very worthwhile effort to seek. Um, it may put you a step closer to decertification. It can certainly help your merits case. There's no uniform uh, test that's being used by the courts for when uh, discovery of absent class members is allowed. These are some of the considerations that the courts look at. It's kind of a compilation from all of the case law. A lot of them seem pretty obvious. If you can't get the discovery from somewhere else, the judge is not going to allow you to get the discovery from absent class members. Same thing if you could get it from the named parties, uh, if the discovery would uh, require the assistance of counsel, and importantly, if the discovery is designed to take undue advantage of class members, or if you think you're going to be able to reduce the class size by having a class member, if a class member doesn't respond to discovery, the court isn't going to allow you class member discovery. In all different types of uh, discovery is allowed of absent class members when it does go forward. The most common type are class questionnaires that go out to the entire group, a kind of survey. Uh, but when you're dealing with class members, absent class members who also happen to be witnesses or declarants, courts often have allowed interrogatories, depositions, and document requests from those witnesses. So that's something to keep in mind. Because it's such an uphill battle in obtaining class discovery, these are my tips for trying to get it. One, if you can include the possibility of class, no, of, uh, uh, class discovery in the notice that goes out, you're much more likely to be able to get it. Uh, the, it takes away the plaintiff's argument that the absent class members had no notice that they were going to have to be involved when they decided whether or not to stay in the case. Really narrow down the information that you need. If you can get it any other way, 
The judge isn't going to allow you that discovery. Keep it simple. The less burdensome your request is, the more plain English you use in a questionnaire, the more likely you're going to get that discovery from absent class members, and you're going to take away the argument from plaintiffs that responding to the discovery will require um, the assistance of counsel. Another thing to keep in mind, it comes up in the cases, is to time it right. Class member discovery takes a long time, especially if you have a class of any size. If you wait too long, you get too close to your discovery cutoff, the judge is going to think that you don't really need the information, you can move forward, and it will be denied. Last, and this is, I think, probably your most forceful point for getting class member discovery of absent class members, if the class member has inserted themselves into the litigation by signing a declaration, by allowing themselves to be li listed as a witness, you have a very strong case for absent class member discovery, and you should try and take it if you can. Another issue that comes up in litigating class actions, it comes up in all uh, cases to some extent, is bifurcation. Uh, when you got a case, a class action that has common issues and individual issues that are sometimes muddled together, both plaintiffs and defendants look at ways to separate those issues to make the trial of the case actually possible. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, of course, is the Seventh Amendment, especially when you're dealing with a trial of common issues with the idea that you're going to do a follow-up trial of damages issues. If you've got a jury that's going to need to reconsider the issues and damages that were uh, all first considered in the, in the common trial, you're going to have a Seventh Amendment problem. There's a very um, effective, or there's a very interesting case, uh, class action jury trial, where this became a big issue, the JDS unifi uniphase case. The order of bifurcation is in your materials. Uh, there, the, both parties agreed to bifurcate commonality and liability, or common, uh, like, excuse me, liability and damages. And uh, there was only 17 days set aside for the jury trial of all class action issues. The judge said that she would not allow the bifurcation unless the defendant waived its right to a jury trial on the damages piece because they couldn't have a new jury on the issue. And uh, because of that, the, the defendant got put in a difficult position of dealing with giving up some of its due process rights in order to have a more efficient trial. So those are some bifurcation issues that could come up that you should think about. Motions and limine uh, provide a great opportunity, again, to educate your judge, to uh, develop facts for uh, moving to decertify the case. Uh, one of the motions and limine in a class action that you surely want to bring is a motion in limine to limit the plaintiffs to presenting common evidence to prove their common claims. It seems obvious, right? That's the way you've got to do it. But inevitably, you may find that plaintiffs are coming forward with highly individual and anecdotal evidence to try and prove the claims of the class as a whole. This is a great tool for educating the judge about the difficult evidentiary issues that will come forward as the trial goes on. Uh, and hopefully, if you get a ruling, uh, you'll have something effective to use during the course of the trial. The other kinds of motions that uh, in limine that can come up deal with opt-outs, the class process. Juries are very interested in knowing when they are dealing with a class action, who is in the class, who are the opt-outs, why did they opt out, and those can be very touchy subjects in the course of the trial. So it's best to try and address those issues in advance uh, during motions in limine. Um, the, other, the other piece that's interesting in this, if you are calling class members as a defendant, if you, if you are calling class members as your own witnesses, if it's post-certification, you cannot talk to those class members to prepare them for their testimony. And so one issue that you may want to consider, it's not technically a motion to eliminate, but is some discussion with the judge about what you can say about the fact that you have not been able to talk to your own witnesses because they are technically represented by opposing counsel. So that's another issue. Throughout this, I've been talking about a lot about what common evidence means. Um, it seems like it should be pretty straightforward, but when you actually get into the weeds on this, it can become a very difficult issue and raises uh, a lot of evidentiary issues that you'll need to grapple with through trial. The Supreme Court, in the Duke's opinion, kind of goes 
the farthest in bringing kind of an overall message, which is you have to have a class-wide proceeding that's going to result in a common answer for the class. Again, that seems obvious. It still doesn't tell you what common is. The Marlowe case, I think, provides a nice analysis, and I would recommend you read that if you find you're in this situation. In the absence of common proof, the jury must have sufficient evidence to make judgments as to particular individuals, but it would lack a basis to extrapolate from those findings to make a class-wide judgment. So you need something to take the proof at trial and be able to say that it applies to all class members uniformly. And sometimes that may take the form of evidence like policies and procedures if they are uniform throughout the class period, apply to all class members in the same way, or an identical contract that every class member signed. That may not be the evidence that's in your case. You may be dealing with anecdotal evidence from uh, class members, and in that case, you really need to look at what is representative testimony. Um, and again, what happens often in these cases is that the plaintiffs are handpicking witnesses. They may not be actual class members or the named plaintiffs who were deemed to be the representatives of the class, and yet they're putting them forth as being representative. And so you, during the course of trial and during the course of trying to decertify the class, need to demonstrate that the testimony from these other class members is not representative of the whole experience. Again, going back to the Seventh Circuit opinion, this, in, this is the case where the 42 witnesses uh, were said to be representative, and the Seventh Circuit said, no way, you can't say that anything about their experience was uniform, it's not representative, it doesn't work, you can't have this class. Jury instructions are critical, they're always critical in helping the jury to understand its role in a class action. Um, that's especially important with respect to common evidence, how they're going to deal with individual issues in the case. I would recommend that you, that you think about a preliminary jury instruction, uh, asking the judge to give preliminary jury instructions, especially if the jury is going to be tasked with sorting common evidence from individual evidence. They need to know that up front. Um, other ones to consider are explaining to the jury what is a class action, how the class is defined in this particular case so the jury understands who their verdict will bind at the end of the day, and again, what is common or representative evidence. Now, unfortunately, because of the dearth of class action jury trials, there aren't a lot of good examples out there to use. California is one of the few states that has pattern jury instructions for class actions. It's not an instruction I would recommend for any defendant. Uh, to use. Uh, you may assume that the evidence at this stage of the trial applies to all class members. I would pass on that. Same for this instruction from the Wang case. You heard the testimony from a few class members, that's representative. That doesn't work. Uh, in the Amphenson case for FedEx, this was the jury instruction that we came up with for common evidence. You should not consider individualized actions unless they reflect the policies, procedures, and practices common to the class. We thought that was a pretty effective way to rein in the fact that the plaintiffs only presented anecdotal in, uh, testimony uh, from 15 witnesses and were saying it applied to over 320 people. Unfortunately, the Court of Appeals and the Washington Supreme Court didn't agree with us. They found that the word common is misleading. And so they said the jury wouldn't understand what that means and were set to go back to a second jury trial in this case as a result. Uh, last, uh, this is, I think, one of the best jury instructions I've come across in terms of defining what common evidence or representative evidence is, comes from the Tyson Foods case, uh, and um, I, I couldn't tell from the docket if it ended up actually being the one used, but it's a great example and something like that should be used. Last, the jury verdict, it's all or nothing. Even if the jury hears evidence that they conclude that some of the class members may have been harmed, Unless they show, unless the plaintiffs show that all class members have been harmed, the verdict should be for the defense. That's a really effective tool for you to use during the course of the trial uh, and to arm your defense-oriented jurors to rule in your favor and to convince the others that they cannot um, issue a verdict that would apply to class members um, who otherwise the, the evidence doesn't apply to. Sorry, I'm stumbling there at the end, trying to go fast because I'm over time. Um, thanks so much. Uh, the PowerPoint is not in your materials, but if you're interested in a copy, I'm happy to send it to you. Thanks.